Hey everyone, Tactics here with my second last advanced Mythic Plus guide for Season 2 of Dragonflight, where in this video I'll be running you through a plus 23 fortified Bracken Hide Hollow, discussing the route that we used, how we handled the various trash pulls and bosses, as well as some tips and tricks that we learned along the way to help you get this dungeon timed on higher key levels. As a reminder here, this route is definitely not pug friendly and is instead more aimed at coordinated groups looking to push keys together. If you're looking for something a bit more suitable towards pugging, I have a series of easy to execute routes over on my channel which you can check out and I'll link that playlist down below. Otherwise, let's get started here where as usual, we want to do a pretty big pull at the start here, especially on Fortified Week. We're going to pop Bloodlust. We're going to pop all of our cooldowns. And so what we're going to see us do here is we're going to actually run up the hill here and turn right and jump off into the water to set up a nice double pull on this cage right here. Um, the big thing here is the Mystic, of course, kicks. Uh, you want to make sure you're getting those. And then this Decay Speaker right here. Decay Surge itself is actually not a terribly important interrupt. If your tank is aware, it's going to be coming. It only targets the tank. But the scary one is going to be that burst coming up. Uh, so we always have a kick assigned to that. So I'm going to group up the pack here. Hit the group up top. And this is going to be a double Mystic pull here. So it's just those Earth Bolts on random targets. And when that Rot Chanting Totem is down, you want to make sure you're kicking those Empowered Bolts there. Uh, we have one range kick assigned to that. Uh, big withering there and these earth bolts now that the totem is down they are going to transform into withering bolts on top of this claw fighters that vicious claw mangle you can see at the top here we have aoe stops assigned to prevent those from going off because uh, on especially on a fortified key uh, if they get more than like one hit in on a ranged it's going to be problematic for sure so there's a lot going on in this pull you've got a bunch of important kicks uh, you've got a bunch of important stops and that's kind of why you want to do a pull like this uh, early on immediately in the dungeon ideally because you have literally everything all defensives all uh, uh, offensives bloodlust pots everything you have and you can get this pull uh down uh relatively cleanly ideally so we do let one withering go off there but luckily we have the disease dispels available to let players actually uh get dispelled off of that especially when we're dealing with the other uh, important interrupts in this pack uh, and you see there the vicious claw mangles get stopped um, when they go out a little bit no one gets damaged notice here the war scourge namely uh is not getting enraged dispelled we do have a melee in the group, but you can see that circle on the ground, the range of that blade storm ability, and not soothing actually buys you a lot of time uh, for this kick. Uh, it saves your tank a bunch of damage, and it saves your melee from the random target bleed coming from the war scourge. So it's actually best not to soothe off that blade storm, which may be counterintuitive, but uh, trust me, you actually don't want to soothe that. Just step outside of that circle. Obviously, you don't want to AFK inside the circle, but otherwise, uh, just let them sit there and blade storm because they are doing nothing uh, in the meantime. Otherwise, here we're going to start grouping up our next pull, which is going to be this four pack uh, with the hunter who got pulled a little bit early here. As you see, this one claw fighter ended up pulling this hunter a little bit early uh, just by running away. So be aware of that. Uh, it can happen. It's a little bit annoying. We don't have a ton of control for uh, the end of packs here. Uh, obviously, like things like Druid Ursouls. Uh, any kind of AoE slow or ring of peace, that kind of thing uh, it would be very good. We were lacking that kind of utility in this comp, uh, but that's okay. And grouping up this next pull here, it's a bit of a breather pull because like I said, you're likely committing a ton to that previous pull. Uh, like I was pretty dry here defensively. Uh, as an example, you see me going a little bit low there. Um, but it's this is just kind of a regroup pull here. And then we're going to go and begin uh, kind of splitting up almost to get Tuskar cages. So the main goal here is to kind of avoid any other double mystic pull from here on out because we just don't have the kicks or really the defensives or offensives to kind of survive another pull like that. We do have a prop paladin, so you could get away with it sometimes, uh, depending on the makeup of the rest of the um, the pull. But we opt to avoid a lot of the, or every other double mystic pull in, in the actual dungeon here. And so how we actually get around to getting these cages is with the priest. So you're going to see after we kill this, uh, four of us are going to go up and do another pull. And then the shadow priest is going to go on a little bit of a run around and get a couple cages. So he's going to go over here and use mind soothe and fade to pick up some of the cages without aggering mobs. So he's going to go get that cage down at the end. And then the cage where we just cleared 
we're going to go do this pull. We're going to get this cage. Uh, and I believe he will end up meeting us here. So he grabs two cages while we clear this one. Nothing super notable this pack. It's three claw fighters. Bone crushers, notably, I think are the easiest mob in this entire area. So basically, like, whenever you can add a bone crusher, you essentially ignore them entirely because all they do is hit your tank. Uh, they have, like, one very small physical tank buster, and that's it. So they're kind of free mobs. So note that. The scarier ones are definitely the claw fighters because of that bloody bite random target hit. You see how much that chunked the rogue for. And, of course, the fixate mystics because they just spam cast their kicks, which can be pretty scary. And then the uh, decay speaker guys um, because they will empower the mystics, and they have that additional uh, one with ring kick that you want to make sure that you get to the priest is here now we're going to be at three out of five cages after this and then we're also going to just continue to pull good packs and avoid the packs actually guarding cages because from here on out all the cages uh have some pretty annoying packs i think there's almost all of them have double mystics guarding them at this point on and so we're just going to go up here healer's going to get that Here's the patrol we missed. You can kind of pull this one whenever. Uh, we're going to pull this down the line here, grab those double claw fighters. I think we also should have added this one mystic here um, because, again, that whole thing I was talking about where bone crushers are fake mobs. Uh, we have now three bone crushers and only one claw fighter. I think adding this with just one mystic and one more claw fighter would have been perfectly fine here. Uh, so recommend doing that. Uh, add both these to this pack here and we're going to slowly back up uh, again we're all five now uh, so we're just dpsing dpsing nothing really noticeable notice again not soothing that rage storm and just using single target stops here on this claw fighter since there's only one of them but they're what you should do and we're slowly pulling a backwards backwards as you can see here towards this bridge over near the uh i guess the uh, northern side here you can see there is going to be a cage right beside us uh, which is possible for the priest to grab and I believe he is going to grab it after this pull So what we're going to group up here is uh, these two hunters Bone crusher two fighters a war scourge and a mystic So it's a pretty decently sized pull here Hunters have the bone bolts that you need to be aware of and they'll also shoot traps at players that you just want to make sure uh, That you are avoiding some things to note about uh, Leashing or whatever uh, these three mobs here are connected. So pulling one of them will pull all of them these three mobs are connected, but the mystic is not connected to any of them. So you need to individually pull this mystic here, which uh, you'll see I actually end up just pulling this three pack. We have to pull the mystic in later. Um, but otherwise, you just mostly want to watch the hunters here. And of course, having the one kick on the war scourge, their kidney on the bone bolt. One bone bolt goes off, but it's not the end of the world because bone bolts in this pull, uh, assuming again, there's a mystic in here and you're kicking the mystic because there's only one kick. It's the only real random damage. Uh, for ranged players uh, so because of that it's not a big deal if you let a bone bolt here or there go off it's just a problem if it wombo combos with like another bone bolt with a mystic bolt going off or with a claw fighter biting a melee player that gets bone bolted that kind of thing so uh, it's not the end of the world if a bone bolt goes off but it's not ideal it is a quick cast but try and stop at least one out of every set that goes out just to make your healer's life a little bit easier and of course aoe stops are always 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 coming for these claw fighters whenever you pull claw fighters you want to try and pull them at similar times obviously these two are part of the same pull but whenever you're grouping a bunch of pulls together try and pull claw fighters around the same time to try and sync up those vicious claw mangles very very, very useful it lets one aoe stop get them all and it kind of lets you uh just just do if you have a comp that doesn't have a ton of aoe stops it becomes much more lenient so see here they desynced a little bit i'm actually not sure how that happened but uh we just gave a single target stop to the one that didn't get stopped uh initially and again just finishing off this pack here we added that mystic a little bit late like i mentioned here and we're just going to start moving to the next pack so we're going to group up this pack here again this wouldn't be here uh, and so because it's here, I end up making this pull a little bit smaller. So what I actually would recommend, because this would have been gone already because we would have killed it, it would have been all this stuff up here without the second War Scourge. So this, this War Scourge is in the pull, but there's one War Scourge up here near the top that isn't going to be in the pull uh, that uh, you would stop at. So you would grab up all these mobs right here and get another double Hunter pull. But again, look, it's, uh, there's Bone Crushers in here, of course. This Mystic and Fighter wouldn't be in here. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, this one goes a little bit weird. Uh, just because I believe, yeah, these guys walk into us and we get one hunter somehow. Uh, so it's a little bit weird. So this poll would just be uh, what I mentioned before. And it'll be in the MDT route as well uh, if you're interested in seeing the specifics of what's in this poll. But basically that two pack would have been gone already. And so you'd be free to run up towards right on top of the two hunters and not pull that war scourge, but pull everything else. 
Uh, we're going to do some weird stuff here, so we pull this later on. And because the hunters are not really mobile, uh, we're going to kill this hunter and then move on. Uh, notably for the Tuscars, uh, he is going to get this one here in the corner. Oh, you can see it actually. They're mind soothed. And he got the Tuscar. So he soothed and then he um, baited to be over here to open that cage. And we're going to go. We need one more cage. And so we're going to kill this hunter. We're going to do this pack here. It's going to be double War Scourge. Uh, again, this is what you would just drag the full health of War Scourge into this pull uh, for the actual route here. And so you'd have the two kicks. And again, when these guys are kind of doing nothing, uh, when they're doing their little spin, you just let them do nothing and just get your stops on the Vicious Claw Mangle here. Not too much to worry about outside of that. And then when this pack starts to actually die, he's going to go and get this right, right there again with Mind Soothe and Fade. And I think we're waiting for Healer Mana here. And we're going to go pull the other side while he's doing that. Again, the last Double Hunter pull here. Focus on trying to get these hunters as best you can. Uh, and, and then outside of that, you're just going straight into the boss. So you're getting a decent amount of count in this first area here. Up at about 47, 48% count once you're done with this area. So a pretty, pretty hefty amount. And that brings you to the first boss here. Now, for us, you kind of want to generally cleave them relatively evenly in some sense because they get their enrage effect when any one of them reaches that health threshold uh what a 15 whatever it is uh but at the same time gash tooth is always going to be the one in coordinated groups that has the biggest chance of killing you because of course he has that random jump around damage and then that fixate as well applying that bleed that kind of acts like grievous where it does ticking damage until you're healed above 90 percent health and so you're going to see all of our prio damage is going into gash tooth and he's going to die the quickest here uh and basically the kicks are all on trick totem uh we only kick bolts we never kick the actual heal effect because we have this priest in here the priest can purge the heal off whoever it goes on any purge can do that of course so if you have a purge in your group mage uh, priest, blood elf, even whatever it is, uh, they can purge off the heal, so you never need to waste a kick on it. Saves you a bunch of kicks, uh, especially if you're not running a prop paladin. Obviously, with a prop paladin, the kicks here are gonna look uh, pretty easy. But even without a prop paladin, you can still get all the kicks. Just make sure you're not wasting kicks into that heal. Uh, facing the group away here, gas frenzy is going to go out. This is the random target damage. Um, the big thing here is having something for the marked for butchery. So we have assigned defensives for marked for butchery here. Uh, it's going out on our uh, healer here. That's pretty easy. Uh, so he, holy paladins are insanely tanky. Um, he has bubble. Uh, I think he just personals this and kind of eats it. Uh, on a higher tyrannical key, he would probably just insta bubble, uh, and that would be it. Um, the rogue has evasion. Uh, he's saved evasion for this. Uh, if he ever gets marked for butchery, he's going to instantly evasion. Uh, similarly, shadow priest has saved dispersion. He's going to instantly disperse if he ever gets picked. Uh, and then the dragon is basically going to get bopped. If the dragon gets picked, he gets bopped. Uh, and, and that's kind of the end of that. And that's kind of how we've assigned defensives for marked for butchery because it does a pretty hefty amount of damage, uh, even on fort, right? That's through a defensive. It took like 75% of his HP and he's a super thick holy paladin who popped his defensive, who is, you know, self-healing, has leech, all that kind of stuff through all his self-healing. So it's pretty, pretty dangerous, especially if this was a tyrannical key. So just keep that in mind. Make sure you have major defensives planned for each individual in case they get picked with Mark for Butchery. Otherwise, as you see here, right, the prio damage is going into Gash Tooth. He is going to be, uh, you know, on the lower end of health here, and he's going to die uh, fairly quickly here. Blade Storm, uh, we try and do this. Like, see, it's kiting through the group here a little bit. Melee can still cleave most of the mobs. Uh, without issues here, you can standing right outside that circle, and they're still relatively grouped, so you still get decent cleave value, and that's kind of the goal, at least. Now, uh, the uh, little combo is about to come out here, so Decayed Senses. I'm going to get Mass Dispelled here uh, to kind of clear that, and then we're going to be cleaving down the actual uh, Extra Totem to free the healer. There it is. And then, of course, as a tank, just kind of stand in the path of the charge. This charge does actually get pretty nasty on higher tyrannical keys again, so make sure you do press some sort of defensive. Uh, otherwise here, uh, again, keeping the mobs grouped up, trying to get kicks on this trick totem, trying not to let 
uh, any of those earth bolts go off, especially during gas frenzy. This is kind of like the scariest time because it's a bunch of random damage going out and then earth bolts on top of that, it can wombo combo uh, pretty uh, significantly, right? If, if, if they hit, the earth bolt hits the same target as one of the gas frenzy ticks, it can be pretty dangerous. So keep that in mind there. Uh, you ideally don't want to let too many of these earth bolts go out. See, we let one go out there, but there was no damage. Uh, so it wasn't the end of the world. Healing going out, like I told you, and we just dispel it. And you can see no one really got healed. So as you can see, we got some decent cleave off. at 45% for Rira, 30% for Trick Totem, and that's when uh, uh, he dies there. And... This is going to make this fight now significantly safer, and at this point, like, we don't really have a priority on which one we're killing. Uh, we just kind of want to try and kill them as evenly as possible there. And the kicks are just significantly less dangerous at this point in the fight, because basically all of the other random damage is finished. Notice also Bloodlust. We didn't quite have it when we got here, but we did Bloodlust uh, as soon as we could. Uh, so... Kind of just sending it on CD here to try and get, uh, a, basically gives you time for a fourth Bloodlust uh, later on down the line in this key. Uh, and again, pretty pretty straightforward, easy once you've got uh, the one boss down. Moving forward here, setting up a pretty decently sized pull out of this boss. Uh, Shapers here, they pretty much just do tank damage. They have one channel uh, that is, you'll want to stop and infuse corruption, which is uh, a stacking disease dot, the, the withering dot, it'll stack it up, uh, so watch that. Other than that, uh, decayed elders, their root can be obviously freedomed, uh, or, or move a snare cleansed in any way, or interrupted, or stopped, so it's not too dangerous. The only kick is the, of importance here is the wilted oak, so we're just going to group up a ton of mobs here. They're obviously going to spawn all these lashers, and don't be fooled here these last years if you actually just ignore them and use them to funnel into the tree you probably will get overwhelmed and die because they do some party damage right they will stack up bleeds on people uh and it is like somewhat dangerous uh if you let this go uh too long so you kind of do need to aoe at least a little bit uh, in this area it's it's not pad uh they do kind of need to die. I know it's it's a little bit of a meme in our group, just yelling they need to die and AoEing, but uh, they do kind of need to die a little bit because you can get overwhelmed. It is it is possible if you are like ignoring them entirely. Not everyone needs to be hitting them here. Obviously, like you can see, uh, not <laughs> based on the DVS meters, some people are hitting them harder than others. Uh, that is true. Um, but as long as like they are dying in a timely fashion and you're not getting overwhelmed by these random target bleeds as you can see in the top corner uh, They're kind of doing a decent amount of random damage because like I said the shapers are pure tank damage They don't hit anyone else So all this party damage here is obviously the bursting and then the lashers and that is it So it's a pretty significant amount of random damage here. So it is somewhat important to uh, get them down But as you see we're kind of just taking uh, the elders with us uh, as we go Big guy died, added more stuff, uh, added more shapers, uh, and we're going to be basically continuing uh, this way, uh, trying to avoid all of the fetid uh, rot singers, I believe they're called. Gosh, what is that mob name? We're going to walk right by one so I can tell you then. Uh, not the shaper. Yeah, the fetid rot singers right there because, of course, they have that pack tactics. They have uh, a pretty annoying totem cast. Uh, which, if you don't swap to, will put a disease on players. I will show you coming up here uh, how we get around that if you ever do pull one, either because you don't have a priest to mind tooth around them all, or if you just, you know, accidentally butt pull one. Um, we pulled one to try the strategy. It does work fine, but if you can avoid them all, would recommend doing that. So we're just going to pull up here, uh, grab this wilted oak, along with those guys just dying. And what I would actually recommend that we don't do here is pull a bunch of mobs in this area back to here. So I'm going to pull this side, the decaying slimes, with uh, the two trees on the end. So I'm going to Avenger Shield into this and pull that slime with the elders here. There's a shaper pack with another elder right over here where my mouse is on the left side of the screen. I would also add them and do that pull here. And that would save you from having to pull the fetid rot singer that I was just talking about. We're about to pull the fetid rot singer after this pull, um, just to test the strategy I'm going to show you. But I would still recommend if you have the priest to dodge the fetid rot singers to just add that extra double shaper pull over here to this pull, 
uh, and then it, avoid them if possible. So uh, Monstrous Decay is going to be the prior target in this uh, this pull, just because that Gushing Ooze is uh, a little bit scary, right? You can see it, it's taking the extra damage. Again, it hits the Holy Paladin, so it's hard to tell. Um, but uh, he probably does the most damage out of any of these mobs, so uh, that's that's the one you might as well be prioing uh, if you have someone that does prior damage. Just hit the Monstrous Decay and do the burst, and we're going to start moving up here as this pack is dying. Uh, I believe I'm just going to bubble taunt this as well, just because it's, it's getting a little bit dangerous. Uh, you know, health is, is a little bit spooky. Bubble taunting all this stuff here. Uh, and then we're just going to be finishing this off. And here's the cauldron we're going to use for uh, the tech I'm I'm talking about. Basically, for those that don't know, this cauldron will give you a free disease cleanse. Uh, and you requires alchemy like 25 to open up. Uh, and basically, you can click it as many times as you want, but it gives you a five-minute buff that's a one-time use. And so basically, if you pull a Fetid Rot Singer uh, to a Cauldron, you can completely ignore their totems because you can just self-cleanse every single time the totem actually does the cast uh, of that disease that it applies to everyone. Uh, and, and basically just lets you never have to swap off of the Fetid Rot Singer. So it saves you from swapping to totems, essentially, if you ever pull a Fetid Rot Singer. So... Uh, that's the strategy if you pull one by accident or if you can't route around one. Specifically this one, uh, some people have problems getting around it without Mind Tooth. I think you can, like, if it's not, like, here in the path, actually, you can run up this way and run around them without Mind Tooth. We're just going to add him and show you. So basically pulling him over to this cauldron. And you see I already have the buff down here uh, from a previous cauldron. Uh, but we're basically just going to ignore that totem that spawned there, that Decay totem. That Withering Cat's going to apply disease to everyone. Uh, and obviously disease spells can dispel themselves. Uh, but if they don't have a disease spell, you can just use your extra action button here. And you just need to get a new one. It's got a 12 second cooldown, but you can see that the K totem is kind of chilling out there for a little bit. And now it's starting to cast again. So it's going to be back, uh, by the time that goes off again, boom, and you can cleanse yourself there. And so that's kind of the idea. Uh, now that being said, I think this mob is still not ideal. Uh, obviously it, it comes with kicks and stuff like that. Uh, and and decent amount of tank damage and the pack tactics. Uh, so I still recommend skipping fetid rot singers in general if you're able to get around literally all of them, uh, because I just I don't think they're good mobs. Uh, and like I said already, what you would do is pull the stuff up here, and that's going to be represented in the MDT route uh, if you're interested. Uh, that I am going to skip every single fetid rot singer in that route. So keep that in mind. Not the end of the world if you pull one though. Take a little bit of a breather after all that. Uh, and then we're going to move up here. We went for, I think, well, we're waiting for mana. Uh, I've got the double oak pull up here. Uh, and we're going to slowly be moving. We want to clear out a lot of these lashers initially, because, of course, uh, you pull a bunch of lashers on the way up, and then you get a double lasher spawn. Because, again, don't want to be overwhelmed. So we're kind of cleaving these lashers a bit. And then I'm going to add, uh, uh, here it is, a shaper, double shaper, and another monstrous decay in this corner right up here before the boss. Just add them. And... Leave them down with these oaks. Again, making sure you have a kick on each of the oaks. A range kick is also fine. Obviously, a shadow priest is not really a range kick. I'm talking about like a 20 to 24 second kick uh, is fine on the oaks. Uh, but, uh, you know, whatever kicks you kind of have, make sure those breaths never go off ideally because they can sometimes be hard to see where they're pointed. Uh, so killing these guys, obviously avoiding the stomps. And then we're moving into three mouth here who's gotten uh, some significant changes uh, since the first Brackenhide video I posted. Uh, so it's, it's a lot uh, nicer now, of course, true. But always make sure you're facing it towards the edge. We pull them to whatever edge we started at, and we start rotating around the room counterclockwise. That's just how we do it. Um, for the case spray, know that it only does a cone in melee. Uh, so you can actually avoid taking damage from this entirely. I'm going to go out here see no one takes damage because the actual Decay Spray damage only deals direct damage to players directly in front of the boss there. Uh, so melee, just make sure you get out of in front of the boss when the Decay Spray uh, is facing whoever. Uh, and if it's on a ranged, ideally, just make sure you're, you stay planted at ranged. It'll shoot the slimes out towards you. But obviously, if you're not standing in the swirlies and if you're not too close to the boss, you will take no damage from this ability, which is pretty nice. Uh, otherwise, we have uh, a rotation of AoE stops on these slimes to prevent these casts from going off because these are now stoppable casts. Earlier on in the season they were not, but now they are. So I'm gonna Divine Toll this first set. Uh, and then I have uh, my own AoE Blind for the next set. Uh, we've got another Paladin with an AoE Blind. We've got the uh, uh, Dragon that has the AoE Knockup and the AoE Knockback. 
uh, and then of course priest with fear and just using a rotation of that for our comp to make sure these guys never get a cast off grasping vines we are going to be using immunities to soak um, so basically what happens is if someone gets eaten and then immediately pops an immunity it'll instantly break the shield you see it was moved after 1.2 seconds uh for those who know we put the rogue in he gets eaten and then after he gets eaten he cloaks you don't want to pre-cloak uh or pre-immune or whatever you wait till get eaten and then you press your immunity he jumps out immune to all this damage and the shield instantly breaks because he got uh, immune out of it and now obviously rogue's gonna do that with cloak um i assume ice block would work as well uh, paladins can do it with bubble and i'm actually going to do it with bubble on the next one as well so uh keep that in mind it can help you uh make this boss just a little bit faster if you never have to actually break through that shield uh it's not the end of the world if you have to break through a shield it just makes the boss a little bit longer so it's a nice little time save there uh, again here's another decay spray you can see it's gonna go out boom he even took a couple steps back it's a very very short cone you literally are, have to be like in melee ring to the boss he took a couple steps back and i'm taking no damage from that decay spray so keep that in mind using aoe stop on this pack and here comes the grasping vines that i'm just going to walk into here i'm just going to stay right beside the boss get eaten by this grasping vines and then i'm just going to bubble boom 1.2 seconds shield goes away note he is a bit weird with bubble taunt here uh, so I do use my cancel, uh, I cancel my bubble, uh, just to make sure he comes back and taunt him during while he's running away so he doesn't go melee someone. Keep that in mind if you're tanking and you use an immunity. Uh, but otherwise, again, grouping up the pack and just cleaving the boss down from there. Uh, that brings us to Stink Breath. Uh, never pull him. That guy is hard banned. Hard banned. So there's a couple ways to get around him. Um, Priest. So mine tooth in a couple places on the bridge that are very wide, you can mine tooth and you can get around on the edge. Uh, it can be sketchy in some parts, depending on where the boss pad is. Uh, lock gate, you can lock gate from this point on the cliff to the far side of the bridge. And if the guy is down here, you can lock gate and avoid him. Uh, you can also uh, have a rogue, mage, hunter, or night elf uh, do an invis skip on him, which is what we're going to do here because of where he is on the bridge. I think it's like it's like this spot here it's like a good skip but we're a little slow here so we're just gonna have the rogue basically tap it uh stink breath you can see obviously oh priest with fade can dodge him wherever they feel like that that's why the priest is gone uh so keep that in mind uh but uh this would also be a not bad spot also uh but basically we're just gonna have the rogue pull him rogue pulls him runs away Everyone else just runs by. With Mind Tooth, it's pretty easy. Just run by not being combat. You saw how close I got to him. Hug right here uh, so that you don't pull the stealth guys because the stealth guys are like right here. Always hug right. You're fine. And notice the rogue is just making sure he runs uh, Stink Breath basically in a big circle and runs back. And then is going to vanish or you would feign or you would invis or you would shadow meld once you got to a spot that was safe. Uh, and then you would reset and then you could make... Uh, Make yourself, uh, uh, or continue running, rather, uh, to the next spot. We get absolutely dominated by this pat, though. Uh, this pat just decides to AFK here. Not much you can do if this happens. Um, it AFKs here for a very long time. Like, this one pats back and forth pretty quickly, but now this one is leaving, right? So, and they all have true sight in, like, in this whole area to a bunch of these guys. So, kind of sucks. We had to wait here a little bit for that, but not the end of the world. Would much rather wait than pull any of these packs or stink breath. Uh, and then we're going straight into the boss. Um, because we accidentally pulled a little bit extra count, we skipped this bear as well. We just sap it. We definitely want to skip the vultures. Uh, and we just are going to go without this bear. But you can just bring that bear into the boss here. I think the root does just bring the bear into the boss. Because all he does is a tank hit. Uh, and then you're into Gotshot, which is honestly a pretty easy boss. Kind of a, a breather. Uh, relatively low health boss. Not too much going on. The biggest thing, though, is making sure that you do kill this first Rot Fang Hyena set because there's not traps out initially, and these guys are going to be the most dangerous with their leap. Um, AoE stops or just individual stops on each of them for the bounding leap and the bite are important because the leaps hurt. They hurt a lot. You never want them to go off, uh, as do the bites. The bites are a pretty nasty bleed, uh, and it was hard to tell if it was a random target or if it was just like the closest person they were bleeding because I would get some of them as a tank and then our rogue would get some of them. So be aware of those. Try and stop those as well because it's a pretty nasty bleed still. You notice stuns uh, to prevent those rot fangs from jumping here. And then we're just going to kill them. Uh, tanks, just make sure you're not getting knocked off the platform uh, or into any of the traps here. Uh, otherwise, uh, the only other job of the tank really is to immediately pick up the hyenas whenever they spawn. Because they will initially 
be uh, aggroable. They won't fixate off the bat. So you can just immediately grab them, as you can see here, and kite them into traps. And basically just be cleaving them, have kicks assigned to Gutshot whenever they initially enter a trap, because that's when that cast begins. And otherwise, we're just cleaving them. And as long as they get chained by that trap, basically, if they're in a trap, even if they cast a leap, uh, they won't actually leap here. I think a cast actually must have gone off because they're enraged here. So we just want to make sure that they actually get uh, murdered uh, before they actually do anything scary. So this one, for example, won't leap, even though it didn't get to go off. I use a stop on the other one. But if they're rooted by the snare, their leap cast will just be unsuccessful. So keep that in mind. You don't need to commit too many extra stops to that. Uh, be careful there. If you don't pull the bear, if I had Avenger shield that, it would have pulled the bear. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, that's kind of also why I, I just pull the bear into this pack. It's much easier to just cleave them down. And again, oh, somehow these hyenas uh, thread the needle there. So I'm going to fight them over while they're still in ag or still aggroable, not fixated, and just be in this trap. That one is not in the trap, so I do need to stun that one with a hodge. Uh, but this one is, there it is. The binding leap went off, but the hyena didn't move because it was trapped. And there's the crippling bite. Also, if you have other stops and they start casting that, both of those targeted the rogue for some reason, even though I was right beside them and had aggro. Not sure what the logic is, if it's just like a random target within range, or if it is just closest target or something like that. I don't know, but needless to say, it's a lot of damage. I believe he dwarfs it off, uh, but it's it's a lot of damage. So keep that in mind. Control the hyenas, and the boss fight is pretty straightforward. Next up here, going for a uh, one big pull, pretty much. Uh, Filth Caller, again, that's a Decay uh, Speaker cast, so it's not the end of the world if that goes off. Uh, we have a Knock assigned to bring this guy over uh, when he starts casting that Rotting Surge. There it is, boom. Uh, just uh, have no Sorolis on the ground here. All these Witherlings and Witherbiters are going to melt. They have Bloody Bite, but it's pretty weak. Uh, just because they will just kind of die in like an AoE stun or two. Obviously, if all these start wither biting, you're going to have a problem. Or bloody biting, rather. You're going to have a problem. Uh, so make sure they do die relatively quickly. Kind of, again, this, the situation with the plants in that whole second area of the dungeon. They do kind of need to die so they don't kill everyone else. Uh, so we're doing a uh, big AoE on the biters. We added the one war scourge here. You can see how much damage the bites are doing here. So AoE stuns are pretty nice to nuke these guys down in. And then I'm going to add two of the um, decay guys in the center of the room here as well, or the vile rot hexers here. And just leave these guys down together. You could probably have added these guys a little bit earlier too, even. I probably could have thrown hammers and grabbed them initially just because they, they are pretty healthy. Could have been a little bit faster withering contagion here just puts uh, an aoe around a couple people and then they'll try and basically suck up the contagion here uh with a detonation cast um what you can do uh is two things one disease dispel the person with the actual contagion and they will just never cast if there's no available contagion uh two if you don't have the right number of disease spells for example if your comp only had one disease spell and you pulled both these rot hexers you would get two diseases and so someone would not be dispelled uh the actual explosion range on uh the uh ability is only 30 yards uh so here it is siphon decay this uh will one shot essentially on higher fort keys uh so if this guy doesn't get dispelled he will be instantly killed this only deals damage to players that have this disease and are within 30 yards. So if you don't have the number of disease dispels to get rid of all your diseases, all this person does uh, needs to do rather is run 31 yards away and they won't die. Or LOS, LOS works well uh, as well rather. Uh, obviously not out here. There's not really much to LOS on, uh, but in the cave, if you get that, you can actually LOS it as well. But also just go 31 yards if you're not a dragon. That doesn't really affect you at all, right? So. Uh, something you can do there if you're just lacking the disease dispels for Siphon Decay, but as you can see there, no damage to anyone because no one had a disease. Uh, so we're just cleaving these guys down. Again, probably should have pulled them a little bit earlier into that pack. Mind soothing this. You don't actually need to wait for Mind Sooth here. Uh, these mobs can just be avoided. Uh, you can just walk around it without Mind Sooth uh, for some reason. Uh, we're going into the cave here. Uh, again, I pulled this in the root, but because we had a little bit of extra percent uh, in this root, we ended up not pulling them, so we just pull... We probably could have skipped him as well with a Mind Tooth, actually. Uh, but we're going to pull him, uh, and then another double Rod Hexer pull uh, with the Rod Hexer in here, and then this Patrol Rod Hexer that comes right into the boss arena. You, you really want to make sure you pull that guy. Uh, otherwise, uh, but pulling a Rod Hexer can be a little bit annoying uh, with the boss. It's perfectly fine if you want to do that, but it can be a bit annoying for sure. Uh, again, Siphon Decays, 
we're just dispelling here because we have three disease dispels in our party. It's not a big deal. Uh, we can get all of them relatively easily. And then basically these rot hexers do nothing because uh, that's that's all they do is they throw the dot out and then they explode the dot. So just make sure also, though, the actual withering contagion person is away from other people so they're not spreading it. Notice that's why all four people here in the party are kind of fanned out like this. And he's just LOSing there. That works as well. And then we're moving into the last boss, which is very, very tough because it's all about totem management. So basically, uh, if you don't kill totems fast enough, if, you know, on higher tyrannical keys, one detonation probably kills you. Uh, maybe you can personal through it if you know you're not going to kill a certain totem in time. Uh, but it's, it's very scary and you want to make sure that your damage is staggered enough uh, such that you're able to kill every single totem. Uh, now... Beacons, Beacon of the Beyond, the trinket from Sarkareth, is actually very powerful on this boss. We are running three beacons in this group. So I have a beacon, the rogue has a beacon, and the healer has a beacon. And basically we stagger our beacons to help kill these totems. Uh, something interesting to note is because the totem is uh, a totem, beacon doesn't split its damage when you use it on the totem. So it'll deal full damage to both the totem and the boss. So that's a neat little tip there. Try and make sure that when you are beaconing the totem, the boss is also in range. Uh... Tanks, it is your job 100% to control the positioning of both the frontal and the totem. So you can see here, I point the front over there and I move basically across. Uh, and this will put the rot burst totem directly across from where the boss is. So because I'm standing here, the totem will spawn in the same spot that the uh, big frontal initially spawned in. So this will cause it to be completely clear. There it is. No AoE around it whatsoever. Everyone, including the melee, can immediately swap to it and have no issues uh, and that's what you want to do basically the entire fight. So you see there's another one coming in 10 seconds. So I need to be already thinking about, okay, where am I going to move to make sure that I spawn the next Rot Burst Totem, not in this circle. So uh, again, we're staggering beacons here. I believe this was the one, one of our beacons. Uh, I'm going to be beginning the next one and now I can see where this is I have six seconds for the next rot burst totem So I need to basically move somewhere uh, such that the spawn is going to be uh, Not in this and this is actually a fine spot right I can basically wait until this comes up to me because now it's going to spawn like over in this area down here I can move it slightly even and that spawns down here like I said and boom, you have so much time, right? You have all this time back here uh, before, and actually this actually even despawns. It doesn't really matter that much, but uh, the main thing here, not spawning it in the middle of one of those choking rock clouds, because that's what's going to end up uh, messing you up, particularly if you have melee in your comp, right? We only have one melee, uh, and he has long arms, so it isn't the end of the world, but if you have like a double melee comp or a triple melee comp, uh, it's going to be very, very rough if you keep spawning your totems in the middle of your rock cloud. So it's always directly across from where the boss is positioned here. And again, that was my beacon. Um, we have one more beacon for the next one. And we also have cooldowns and stuff like that. So I think we're going to beacon the next one. And we have cooldowns for the one after that uh, coming up. So again, rock cloud, I'm going to move such that it's going to spawn kind of where I initially put that rock cloud. Here comes the totem there. And that's basically exactly where I put it. So that's a good strategy to, to do. Put the rock cloud in one corner, immediately move across the room, directly across the opposite corner to drop the uh, the totem in the corner you dropped the, the cloud in. And then just kind of keep the boss slightly in front of the next to uh, the, the cloud from then on. And then it'll spawn another totem directly across the room and then that'll despawn. You just focus this one down uh, easily. Uh, one of them here does go off, I think, but we are able to defend. this one go off? Oh, I think we killed that one. I actually can't tell. Uh, but either way, it's not the end of the world if you can see that you don't have damage for one or you can see that, hey, uh, this one's going to go off. If you all pop defensives, you can live to a certain key level. Obviously, there's some situations where it's not going to happen, but um, you want to just basically have all your damage for totems. You, putting damage into the boss here, I think, is a bit of a bait, and that's going to that's what's going to wipe a lot of groups is you just don't have damage for certain totems. Uh, and, and that's kind of why, and staggering damage is pretty important, planning out your CDs, uh, obviously beacons help a lot if you can have multiple beacons in your group, uh, even having casters swap to beacon for this entire dungeon, even though it's not great earlier on, for this boss specifically to get through, because I think this is going to be the gate for a lot of groups in, not just fortified, or tyrannical keys rather, but fortified as well. 
But hopefully this helps you out in this dungeon, guys. And if it does, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more content like it. If you have any questions at all that I didn't cover about this dungeon, feel free to drop those down in the comments below. Or if you prefer, you can always ask me over on my Twitch channel at Tactics, where I stream all of these Mythic Plus keys and rating from a tank's perspective. Of course, I've got to give a big thank you to all of my subscribers over on Patreon. Your support really does mean a lot. Otherwise, thanks everyone else so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.